Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Vegas 52. I'm Paul Shaughnessy. On the line, we've got Cody Saftik. Happy 420 to those who partake every single year, um, every single day. Yeah, I don't think it's a very big deal for people who partake every single day. It was more of a thing that when you, you do when you're a kid. I, I went to University of Ottawa. I would go up to Parliament Hill, hang out with all my hippie buddies, you know. Now it's just a, it's just kind of a way of life. Everything's legal, yada, yada, yada. How was your week, Cody? I know we did a, it's been eight days in between us recording, so I, I feel like it's been an eternity. It's been a struggle for me, struggle bus. Three of the last four cards, getting absolutely owned. Last week, I was like, you know what? I went 0 for 3 on my picks, or my bets. I'm like, you know, Cody's going to get me out of this. And you, uh, you fully intended on hedging in the main event you know me i'm team no hedge plus i'm trying to get cody's parlays to bail me out of these things and Bilal muhammad fights incredibly smart parlays don't come through it's it's been a rough little stretch so i'm hoping we get back on track this week but uh how was your week how are you doing this week buddy yeah, not bad. I did the same thing actually on the Bellator on the Friday night. I set up a great hedge out opportunity, which I fully intended to take. Did a preview for the Bellator show on CJ MMA's YouTube channel. And yeah, I don't know why I didn't take it. Last second, I'm feeling real good. Team no hedge. Watch the fight. In my mind, I thought we won. Apparently, the internet disagrees. The main thing is that the judges disagree and AJ McKee loses. So yeah, when Luke is set up in the same spot, just have that same gut feeling. It's like, is this... A walk in the park or could something go wrong yeah of course you and i discussed it blah muhammad looked awesome against wonder boy pacing looked good wrestling looked improved and beyond all that he just fought an excellent ring iq game plan so this week's going to be pretty similar like i think the value on jessica and Josh right now looks pretty good like she's not even a two to one favorite at the same time it's a women's mma match so i'm probably going to put it on the top ticket with the intention that if i can get three four tickets going here going into the main event uh i would expect the unexpected and probably hedge out as well yeah, and I mean, with this main event, Jessica Andrade taking on Amanda Lomas in the main event, minus 190, Jessica Andrade plus 160 for Lomas. The big thing about it is that Andrade has been back up at 125 pounds recently, so is she going to show up looking like Skeletor? Is she going to come show up looking super rough with her return to straw weight? That's like, she's very, very thick, very, very powerful. I kind of, I like to call her Lady Lineker, uh, but she's got better wrestling than my boy Johnny Lineker, but it's, you know, extremely aggressive hooks. Um, obviously, she's trying to get herself back into the title conversation. Amanda Lamas, when we saw her against Angela Hill, we saw the limitations of her game, I think. That was like the first time she had looked, uh, she'd looked like a, a real prospect on the rise. She takes on uh, Angela Hill, and it's, you know... It, uh, the the level of competition caught up with her you know going through some of her other fights she was fighting low level people and she was putting them away as you should like uh L L Lavina Souza she you know her best days were in Invicta uh neck tat my girl neck tat monster at Louis uh, Ruiz Conejo I liked her against uh, Shea uh, and Vlismas because I didn't think that she could defend the move. But it's like, all you had to do is defend the move. And, and she rolls right through her. Angela Hill put up some, uh, you know, put up a little bit of a fight against her. Was able to take her down once, which I think is a huge path to victory for very, very powerful uh, Jessica Andrade. She can, or she can hang on the feet in this spot. She can land shot. She can hurt Lamas. But I think, like, get this fight to the mat and bullying her, bullying her down there will be the path to victory for her. I, I agree with you. I think she probably wins this fight at least 70% of the time, which would be like a minus 233 uh, money line. I still think there's value on Andrade, but the weigh-in is a little bit of concern. If she shows up looking really, really rough, I don't know if I want to get too invested this early in the week without seeing that little tidbit of information. That being said, it may... You know, maybe everybody else is waiting and this is going to spike up to minus 250, in which case I think that most of the value would be gone. On the feet, it should be competitive. Lamas is dangerous, but uh, Andrade only loses to the best people 
in really any division that she's a part of, uh, besides bantamweight, of course. Um, but yeah, 125, 115, she's losing to some of the best female fighters in those divisions of all time. And that's it. She doesn't lose to anybody else. So Andrade for me, sounds like it's Andrade for you. Of course, man, there's a giant experience difference here. As you mentioned, not only did she used to fight at 135 pounds, she was competitive against them. She has wins over Raquel Pennington, who's still competitive at 135 pounds. At 125, you know, very competitive. This is some, someone who's a former world champion. She's got all the experience in the world, only loses to not only the best girls in the division, but the best girls of all time, just like you allude to. That's huge. When you look at Lamar, she made her UFC debut at, at 135 and absolutely got routed by Leslie Smith. Took two and a half years off. And since then, Miranda Granger, cut. Mizuki Inoue, cut. Livion Souza, cut. Monster Ruiz, like you said, she's a one-trick pony with the head and arm throw, which it, it has worked for her. But come on, let's get real over time. And then Angela Hill. So the Angela Hill is the first real step up in competition as far as I'm concerned. Here's a perennial contender, someone who's always knocking on the top five you know, doorsteps. This is a legitimate fight. First round, Lemos looks as advertised. She's strong. She's athletic. She's beating Angela Hill to the punch. She doubles her up on the punch count. She zings her. I think she gets a, a knockdown in the first round. Second round, it's a reverse of fortunes. All of a sudden, Angela Hill's working her way back into that, picking her apart, doing some excellent work, doubles her up in the strike count. Third round is one of those coin flip type fights. Women's MMA, of course, goes back and forth. For my money's worth, I thought Angela Hill was coming forward. She's being the aggressor. Striking is pretty well close, pretty well even. I just thought on a personal level, Angela Hill won. So I was interested in seeing what uh, MMADecisions.com said about it. And uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There was 11 people that cast their vote for media members, and 10 of them had Hill. You know, you're talking about Jillian, Jillian DeCourcy, who's the former Invicta fighter, MMA News.com, Wrestling Observer, Bloody Elbow, MMA Mania, MMA Junkie, Sure Dog, Sure Dog, Sure Dog, Bloody Elbow. Everybody else seems to have Angela Hill. I got Angela Hill. Striking numbers suggest slight edge Angela Hill. Yeah, yeah. But no, nah, split decision goes the other way. So that's actually her first step up. Like it's a top five competitor. I didn't think she won, right? And not only that, the one round that she did win was the first round. She may have been slowing down ever so slightly, second or third. Now you throw in her a five-round fight against Andrade. Well, if Andrade gets the grappling going, like you said, and I hope she does, it's just going to wear on Lemos, I would think. The longer the fight goes, she is going to fatigue. You should think Andrade should have a little more success. Standing, it's, it's difficult to say you have a striking advantage over uh, Jessica Andrade. Because just like John Lineker, striking advantage out the window. And she just flies at you and cooks you to the body. Even people who are real good, real technical, beat her to the punch. You know, at some point, she's able to just close the gap and get a hold of you. You can't rely on her picking someone up and slamming them on their head again like she did against Rose Nama Yunus. But again, this is a girl that's got X factors, man. She can take a bit of a beating. She can persevere. BJJ Black Belt, very physically strong, has the experience. And then the one thing where it's like, she's 33. She's starting to slow down. Lemo, she's 34, right? Mm -hmm. They're actually the same age. So it's not like this is a passing of the torch. It's not like Lemo, she's some great prospect. This girl came to the UFC, got dusted by Leslie Smith, took two and a half years off, and then has had a kind of a soft run since then. But they're trying to capitalize on the fact that she just beat Angela Hill, so they're throwing into her, into a main event while her stock's still hot. Because if she loses one, what else can you do with her? She probably falls down the pecking order. I picked Andrade over Cynthia Calvillo, but part of me did wonder, does it not burn you out mentally knowing you're the second best? Or does it not mentally burn you out knowing that there's just – such a high level competing at it all the time and you're trying to find this and you're moving weight classes and like at some point do you ever lose that motivation like nah nah not in Josh and Josh just shot she's one of those like cyborg Brazilian fighters where you know again like a Lineker someone who's just tough and rugged and losses on the record don't matter they're just going to show up and they didn't do the damn thing and that's what I like so I'm definitely backing her again I think the price tag is quite generous she seems to have the better skill set she's got vastly far or better um, experience she's been there cardio seems to be an edge toughness seems to be an edge like I, I would think she's the rightful play but because it is women's mma five round fight tough weight cut like you alluded to it probably still is a hedge out situation if you've got enough riding on it and if you're in a situation where you can let it ride financially then yeah i'll let it ride too i do like jessica and Draj, but uh helps out that it's the main event at least all right, we got Clay Guida taking on Claudio Puelas. Clay Guida and Claudio Puelas. It's a dead straight pick em, Cody. Who, who you got here? Uh, so this one, yeah, dead straight pick em. I think it probably could go either way. I think it may be a decent enough live betting opportunity where you might 
bank Clay Guida after the first round. The reason I say this is I'm just not really a Claudio Puelas fan whatsoever, but I'll give him his credit in that he's still only 25 years old and he's training full-time at Stanford MMA now. His striking seems to be improving, but he's not a good striker and he's a terrible wrestler. And his submission game, goddamn knee bars keep coming out of left field. But at some point, as you move up the the rankings and you start fighting better guys, more skilled guys, you're not going to be able to just rely on those moves. That's kind of his problem to me, is that when you look at him, he's fought a whole bunch of non-wrestlers and still has managed to get taken down. He has like a 50% takedown defense ratio in the UFC, but got taken down by Chris Grootsmacher. Got taken down, Grootsmacher one for one on the takedowns. Fought a terrible game plan. Only tried one takedown, but he got it. Uh, Jordan Levitt. Jordan Levitt took him down twice. Jordan Levitt, complete non-wrestler. And then you even see like Felipe Silva when he does take him down. It's one for one. Like this guy's not the most physically strong. Again, he is young. He's developing. But the takedowns should be there. Once you take him down, then there's a good chance you can just sit into his guard. And that's what Clay Guida is going to look to do. Of course, he's a guy that's just been around the block a zillion times over. And his submission defense looks weak because mm-hmm. he's been submitted so many times. But he's learned a lot since then, right? And he's not really giving... Last time he got officially choked out in an MMA fight now is three years ago Jim against Miller. Jim Miller, who's and before one tough that, sumbit. Before that, it was Charles Dobronx Oliveira, the, the <laughs> submission king, really. So... Yeah, absolutely. He's fighting, so what I he's fighting, you know, well credentialed long term winners in the UFC and getting submitted yeah, and in always, those situations. And he's always been around the block and he's always fought the big name guys and always fought good talented guys and he's always give a good count of himself. Even if you look back to this Leo Santos fight his last time out, he completely gets owned in the first round. He is getting beat up, he gets dropped, he's hurt. Even Leo Santos, a decorated BJJ practitioner, I mean he briefly fishes for a front end lock, but he's like, nah, bails on it. And Clay survives another day. And then low-key, he shows up on this Fury Pro Grappling 3 match against Billy Q. I'm sure you watched it because we're hardcores, right? And there was live betting odds. Why the hell did I take Billy Q? And it was mesmerizing, dude. Billy threw up 100 submissions. And Clay sat on top of him and defended 100 submissions. It was actually quite impressive, dude. He shut down everything. Didn't do anything. Didn't do anything. Didn't pass guard. No submission attempts of his own. Absolutely nothing. Score takedown, set up shop on top. All he did. And, of course, the judges award him the decision because he shut everything down. And, ow, I might pass a side control once in five minutes. Like, I think that's similar to what he can do here. Puelos probably has a, a bit of a striking advantage. Not because Clay can't outstrike him. You know, we've seen Clay go out there and he, he looked okay against Mark Manson. And there's other performances where striking looks a little bit like it's a little bit better. I, mean, he, I think he could have success against Claudio Puelas standing, but for my money's worth, Puelas is spending a lot of time working on his strike, and that's why he saw it way better against Chris Grusmacher. That's why he probably moved down to a camp like Sanford MMA. But the real money here is if Clay just grinds up against him, up against the cage, because we all know Clay can fight three rounds, right? That's how Clay makes his money. He fights a hard three rounds. This kid tends to tire, and people love to talk. Well, people love to talk. <laughs> Me and you, we're talking right now, him versus Grusmacher. So Puelas in the first round mauls Grusmacher, and Puelas in the second round, also mulls Grusmacher. In the third round, Grusmacher's beating him up, dude. He outstrikes him 17 to 8 before he falls on top of him and gets caught in a knee bar. So uh, Grusmacher, for as tired as he was and as beat up and having no success, the third round he's pushing the pace on Paulus. Paulus didn't quite look with it. You know, I, I think Clay, who's just a notorious grinder, will grind on him, tire him out. But it's even money right now, and you'll get, you'll get plus money after the first. I think if Puelas is with it, he'll be with it in the first. And then Clay should be able to grind on him after that. But yeah, honestly, it is a coin flip fight. When you do see it on the parlays officially, it's going to be lower on the list. But the official pick will ever so slightly be with uh, the Carpenter Clay Guida. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think you alluded it alluded to it pretty well that Clay's really made some serious improvements in his overall grappling game, as evidenced by taking on Billy Q in the uh, in that grappling competition. That is a that is Leo Santos. I mean, who's that? No, I know that that dope. That fight as well. (laughs) That I mean, that one that one hurt me particularly. I did not. Nobody on Mm. earth had Clay Guida by sub in that situation. (laughs) I assure you of that. I agree with pretty much everything that you're saying. I don't know if I'm going to add Clay before the fight, but it is a fight I will be paying attention to live because Clay has been extremely durable over the years. He's got that way of just. Winning rounds, the judges, for whatever reason, sometimes it, uh, like him. he throws punches, doesn't necessarily land them, but he's super active. He's in and out of the pocket constantly, and it just rubs certain judges the right way. It, it works out. So, uh, 
Yeah, Clay, Clay by decision could be a uh, good looks, and Clay in the live market could even could even be better. Uh, moving on down, we've got Alexander Romanov taking on Chase, the Vanilla Gorilla Sherman. Romanov was supposed to take on Tanner Bozer. I think that that was a really interesting test for him. He was a massive favorite in that spot. Uh, Chase Sherman was cut like last week. Um, he's three and eight in the UFC, loser of his last three, one and six in his last seven fights. Um, uh, no, but I props to him for taking the fight. Cause I don't imagine there were too many, uh, heavyweights that wanted to take on Romanov on short notice like this. And, you know, Chase has some of the things that would be interesting. I suppose he's a, he's a prolific leg kicker. That is kind of his game. But when you're throwing those leg kicks, just takes getting caught, like one of them getting caught. Like I could see him landing some of them pretty early, um, but he's going to end up flat on his back early and often. And I mean, it's really hard to, at this price of my t- minus 1400 plus a 50. I mean, sure. There is some, uh, you know, you go, okay, well, what could go wrong? How could I get some money involved in this? But Romanov's going to take this guy down. I mean, Romanov, you know, I was mad at him after the Espino fight, but he showed up. He showed up last time out against Jared Vander, another low-level opponent, don't get me wrong, but I mean, Chase Sherman is at least on the level of Jared Vander, maybe even lower level than Vander. This should be one-way traffic, and it's priced as such. Romanov, Romanov round one. It should be a smash party. Uh, any Anything to add there, buddy? Yeah, I mean, it should be a smash party, and the line definitely dictates that. But again, they are heavyweights, so I suppose if you want to see somebody slip on a banana peel, I guess it could happen. But yeah, no, I'm Team Romanov. You know me. I've been on Romanov the entire way. I think the one time people maybe gone, got, gone against him, I stuck with Romanov. They had Espino. <laughs> They Shut think Espino won. Mouth. I got yeah, right, right, because you're on Espino. I mean, I we saw we saw we saw people pull <laughs> Alexander Romanov's what twice last weekend. Um, yeah, we got yeah, a it's, it's the MMA has thing. got a they've got to fix this. Like this is this is going to be a recurring issue at this point. Any sort of uh, foul in the third round is like an eyebrow razor at this point. Like I don't know, it's it's a bit of a mess. And uh, it showed up twice last weekend, which makes it seem even worse. <laughs> but obviously, you have Aljamain Sterling. Obviously, you have the Romanov versus... Uh, like, if you're up two rounds, try to commit a foul that is going to hurt your opponent without it being... Well, even even uh, the second one that, w- that we had, um, there, was, there was a point taken away. But it was still qualified as unintentional like i mean the entire system's a mess like if you're up two rounds start committing fouls hopefully it's deemed unintentional and you got the dub easy game like that's it's a big big leak in mma judging at this point i think it's going to be exploited a whole bunch more especially when you're paying people um half of their purse comes from winning a fight so it's just yeah but you're giving people incentive to to do that if you're up two rounds why wouldn't you just commit a whole bunch of fouls at this point well i'll tell you i'll tell you why i'll tell you why well one i don't know it's so bad for the reputation i'm sure but beyond that right you got you can't just be up two rounds you got to be up two rounds and you have to be winning the third Mm -hmm. because otherwise if they scored the third for him and you lost a point it's a draw right so if you already won two rounds and you're winning the third, why not just finish the fight, right? Like, you're, you're about to beat him 30-27. You think this is a good time to almost get yourself disqualified? This is the time? This is the time? You won the first two rounds? You're winning the third? This, this is the time? Who thinks about it like that? And then for another thing where people are like, oh, man, these guys are trained professionals and they know better. No, they don't. They don't know better. I'll tell you why they don't know better. None of them practice these positions no. in the gym for the most part because you're not kneeing your training partner in the face while he's a downed opponent, okay? So it's like a primal instinct, heat of the moment thing. Now, Paul, you've been watching MMA for almost two decades now. How many times do you see in the post-fight interview when the commentator's like, you got dropped in the second, and the fighter will be like, I got dropped in the second? They don't know. They don't know because they just got punched in the head. <laughs> These guys are in there, and they'll block out for a spot some time. You think this guy's wise enough to think to himself, yeah, his fingertips might still be down. Nope, nope, doesn't even remember throwing the knee. 
And when the doctors got you and the refs got you and they're 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 disciplining them like, hey man, you can't do that. Half the time they're thinking, do what? Do what? What did I do? So fighting is unlike any other sport, you know, and people don't black out rage and go out there and this and that, but like you can't hold them to the same standard over it's like, well, you committed a foul. No, I agree. Maybe take two points. Maybe that's the move. If you need somebody in the head and they cannot continue, maybe it's a two point infraction. And I know last week, you know, the guys that committed the infractions were yeah. guys I had in my tickets. Needed them to win, and I'm happy with how things went. But I can agree, it's a bit of a broken system. But we've been talking about a broken system for a while. Yeah. Now, Pat Mayo said we wouldn't be able to do a short show this week. And it's not because we can't run through the fights. My it's because we get talking about side crap. So, jumping back into this, and hopefully me- Roman up doesn't get himself disqualified. Because otherwise, it's takedown city and, and smash city, right? Yeah, and I, the only thing I will add to our discussion there is that Budai, I mean, Budai was dominating that fight. Chris Barnett was looking for a way. He didn't even want to go back out in round three. Broken rib. So, and I thought that one was, like, pretty tough. It's like when the guy's got his head down and he's constantly turning it, like, you're bound to hit the back of the head a little bit. And Kyle Barallo looked uh, incredible. Looked absolutely incredible that entire fight as well. So, it's like the rightful winners won the fight. So, you can't really be all that mad it's just uh it's 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 a fickle it's a fickle game it is what it is all right in 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 the second round of the Baral fight though right he gets him uh he gets the russian down right and he goes to land this dirty illegal knee and he and he peels back you seen it right he mm-hmm. peels back it was like whoa high ring iq he recognized this is an illegal move and stopped himself but the guy was all the way down. Like, why would he have even thought this would have been a good idea in the first place? But he held himself back. So when he commits it in the third round, it, again, it's difficult to say, oh, man, he screwed up because he doesn't know better. Clearly, he does know better. Clearly, he does know better. But again, it's a combat situation. Like, it's it's different than another sport. These A lot of these guys will tell you, you know, I'm willing to die. And that sounds like a cliche saying, but the, the mentality is I'm, I'm going to go out there and go for everything. This dude's been passed over by the UFC. He's making his debut. He wants to go out. There. He's the underdog. He's fighting undefeated Russian. You're going for broke. Um, yeah, to pass, the last thing I'll say on Romanov, Sherman will obviously pass on on this one, is when you look at Sherman, he's had a lot of these fun, like, ro- rock'em, sock'em, robot-style fights, and that's where people like him at his best. But, you know, that's where you fight. Parker Porter, Andre Arlovsky, Ike Villanueva, Sakai, Big Titty Willis. They're just guys that are kind of going to stand in and have a good time. When he fought Jake Collier, Jake Collier just took him down, which I guess you don't really see a whole lot of guys do, and smoked him. A former, oh my, a former oh middleweight, a former God. middleweight who just got straight up fat, just took him it, down and saw the what do you think Romanov is going to do to him? Exactly. I think it's at like that you, moment Jake Collier wrote the blueprint and said, "Oh," <laughs> and presented it. It was just like you just do this, just do this, and that's what Romanov figures to do. So yeah, yeah I got to agree. Pat had something to say. Uh, normally, when you guys go in your tangents, I, I don't really give a shit about any of that stuff. However, if you're going to talk about potentially gaming the rules that are in place in order to greasy win, you're speaking my language. Like, this is this is all I do when it comes to fantasy sports, gambling. Look for those little edges. Like, if that's something you could actually pull off, which you say that you, it isn't, I'm all for it. It's a great move. I mean, they, they get paid half of their paycheck for winning a fight. If you're up two rounds, cheat. Cheat. Until they change the rules, the system is set up for you to cheat. And that's just... And go to a technical decision. You ain't gonna lose. You gotta make sure you're at least... Like, go in there. You have to shoot, be winning the entire shoot a fight. Quick, that's shoot a why quick both take. those guys won. They were winning the entire shoot fight. Shoot a quick takedown and then start poking at eyeballs, man. Poking <laughs> at eyeballs. Mm. You got... Yeah, I mean, it... it, it, it it doesn't seem like it would work out based on how Cody has described this, because why wouldn't you just it win? It worked out twice! <laughs> sure, but it seemed like they were winning anyway. They were going to win yeah. anyway, both of those but, guys. But and then their their opponents were trying to, uh, were basically trying to like game the system to get a disqualification <laughs> so that they would win. So it didn't work out for them, but Peter Yawn, he's starting to take over the fight. And they, I mean, it was the most illegal of illegal knees the first time against Aljamain Sterling. Uh, it was, yeah, it was a very, very poor time. Algermain is smart enough to know that he is probably up on the judges' scorecards and, uh, and pulls it off. I mean, it's, uh, Romanov pulled off the ultimate stunt and I had to do a shoey for it. And, you know, with, with my celiac disease, you know, I, I would, I would say Alexander Romanov contributed 
to my symptoms. So thanks, Alex. Uh, but yeah, he's going to absolutely roll this weekend. Pat seems like you have something yeah, else to say. Yeah, no, I like what you're saying, though. You should take advantage of it until, if there's a rule in place that's a bad rule, take advantage, if you can, until they change it. Remember when Sean Avery was, like, face-masking Martin Brodeur in the playoffs? Mm -hmm. Then they instantly had to change the rule the next night? Just do shit like that. It's true. You know what? There's a rule that says you can't spike a guy on top of the head, but then Neil Magny hits a guy with a pile driver, and everyone's like, whoa, it's so cute, so cute. Nobody cares. It's an illegal move because it was so cute. It was An really cool. elbow to the back of the head, not that cute. A knee to the to face to a downed opponent, not that cute. On the street, super cute. In the cage, not that cute. Yeah, you're going to have to pull off something. I always thought to myself, I've been thinking about this for 10 years. I've never seen it happen, okay? You're in an arm bar, okay? Arms flexed out. Dude's got the arm bar. You see the position all the time, Paul. They'll grab, you know, palm to palm, and they'll, they'll lift. And again, you could spike the guy on the top of the head, which apparently is illegal. They'll let you do it to get out of an arm bar, though. And you could shake, you know? They'll try to shake to clear the elbow. You see it all the time, right, Paul? Mm-hmm. Okay. So dude's got you in the arm bar. You palm to palm. You lift him up. And you soccer kick him in the face. Because at this point, he's not on the ground. You've now lifted him. He's not a ground opponent. And I've talked to a bunch of people. I was like, could you do it? And half the time they say, no, no, why not? Uh, yeah, but there's no point of contact. Well, then no point of contact because you've lifted him. You're, he's on your arm. He's latched on your arm. You've lifted him. Now people have said, well, from that position, you wouldn't be able to turn and kick him in the face. Oh, yes, you could. So I uh, haven't seen it yet. But comes down to these, you can't set it up in a fight because why would you give your arm up? <laughs> you don't want to get arm barred. But I think if you were going to get armbar, you had no other way. You lift that thing up and you just turn them hips and you punt them in the face. I, we need, I'm telling we, you, we need to I see think this. It would work. We need to see. Yeah, this unless happen. you got like a Gilbert Burns on your arm, it'll snap your arm. But whatever. I think it could work. I think it could work. Haven't seen it in MMA yet, but it's gonna go down eventually. We just have just had... like that one FC guillotine escape with the backflip. You don't see it often, but that don't mean it don't work. Yep. One day, one day we'll get there. All right. Let's get let, – we'll, we'll start firing through these fights now. We got Macy Barber taking on Montana De La Rosa. Macy Barber minus 190 favorite. Montana De La Rosa can be had for plus 160. What's your take here, buddy? It looks like a pretty good price tag again on Macy Barber, but it's women's MMA, and I don't want to find myself falling into that trap. But listen, there's actually a decent amount to like about her. When she initially explodes onto the UFC's radar, she's talking a little bit too much crap. I'm going to be the youngest UFC champion, younger than John Jones. I'm the best. She moves around to a couple different camps. You kind of don't like that mentality. Her father, uh, Bucky Barber, he's like kind of got a big influence on her. He seems like a douchebag. So I don't know. You know, she's going to run into some trouble eventually. But you you got to give her, right? Wins over J.J. Aldrich and Jillian Robertson, really not all that bad. The Roxanne Modafferi fight, she's young. She's taking on the savviest veteran in women's MMA history, if you think about it. And she potentially hurts her knee early in the first round. So even though it is a terrible performance, at least you can write up some type of excuse for her. The fight with Alexa Grosso, the first two rounds, she does not look good. The third round, she's coming on very strong. She kind of just had a late start to that round, but you can see she's building up. Now, again, this is someone who's only 21 years old. She's fighting a top contender in Alexa Grosso, who's still by today's standards top five in the division. And the third round, there's a lot to like about her. She just has to overcome a slow start. That's the same slow start is on display against Miranda Maverick, whereas the first round she loses, she gives up her back. The second round, I thought she got outstruck, and I thought she lost the second round. And then the third round, she's all over Miranda Maverick. She scores the takedown. She starts putting that pace, putting that grind. The skill's there, especially for a young fighter. She's just a bit of a slow starter. Now, she's taken off all of almost a year since that Miranda Maverick fight. So I have to believe still only 23 years old. She is improving. She is getting better. If she just puts the pedal to the metal a little bit earlier, I think she could go out there and just be the more physically stronger girl than Montana De La Rosa. I don't want to say necessarily be the better grappler, but if Montana De La Rosa is a little bit more technical, but Macy Barber is the stronger fighter, I think she'll get away with making a few mistakes here and there. As far as striking goes, Montana De La Rosa has definitely worked on her striking, but her striking defense is not very good. She gets hit a whole lot. Mm -hmm. She tends to bust up. She tends to bleed, and it doesn't look good for judges where you're putting in all this great work, setting up low kicks, moving the jab, you know, working your way into the pocket, and then your opponent slugs you with a couple of big punches and busts you up. So it's entirely possible that Barbara's still too green, still too young, still going to go out there and get manhandled. But Miranda Maverick is very physically strong, one of the best girls in the division, right? And especially if you want to grapple, very, very tough opponent. In fact, a lot of the top girls in the division are bringing her in as training partners now because it's hard to replicate what she brings to the table. Alexa Grosso, meanwhile, again, a top contender in the division. She's fighting them at like 21 and 22 years old and showing good moments <clears throat> there's going to well, be come a time where she puts it all together. And Montana La Rosa just never really put it all together. 
She looked good her last time out against Ariane Lipsky, but prior to that, you know, uh, the Buena Silva fight's a draw because of a point deduction on the side, side of Silva, but you know, she lost two of those rounds. Viviana Royo fought a fight easily outmuscled. The Andrea Lee fight fairly easily outmuscled. It seems to be physicality, seems to be the difference when she fights better competition. And I think Barber might be a little bit physically too strong. So I'm going to take Barber minus 190 again. I think it's a decent enough price tag, but it could be a trap price as well. It could be a trap fight, could be a trap line. You might want to pass altogether, <clears throat> but but I think Barber gets the job done. I am not playing Chalk Barber. Fair enough. Minus 190. I mean, she did okay in round three. Go on to MMA decisions because, yeah, memory serves me correct. Like, the entire world thought Maverick won that fight. Literally Everybody. every mm. single journalist who scored that fight went Mavericks round one and two and Barbara round three. The only person who benefit well obviously she won her she got her uh, her win but i benefited from that because you had to do a shoey uh, <laughs> because you had maverick but it was a straight up it was a straight up robbery i felt bad watching you put your lips uh, to that shoe that day but it felt like real payback for the espino versus uh, romanov sp- uh, stunts Either way, I, I really do think of this as a dogger pass type of situation because Macy Barber just rarely ever shows up. Like, if she shows up and just goes, you know, just goes heavy, heavy, uh, heavy, heavy volume, gets really, really aggressive, I think she can muscle around Montana De La Rosa, but I can see a lot of, I could see some cage work. If Montel- Montana De La Rosa takes this fight to the mat a couple times, uh, top, top control holds on to position like I think it's really really greasy I think it's dogger pass I'm probably going to stay away from it um from a betting perspective unless I see something that weigh-ins this week but uh yeah I think it's uh, Montana De La Rosa or pass in this situation I do not want to lay the wood at minus 190 at Macy Barber we got Manel Cop taking on Sue Maderji minus 190 Manel Cap plus 160 Sue Maderji I bet cap, but it was uh, earlier in the week. I got it was minus 149 at one book. It was minus 141 at another book. Uh, I've write, written it down at minus 145. The big thing for me, the big takeaway for me is Manel Cap last time out. Because we always kind of like, you know, we we mark this guy as, oh, he's very, very talented. He's very, very skilled. Obviously, he was very, very touted coming into the UFC. But the volume, the volume just isn't quite there. Well, he threw the volume right out the damn window last time out there because round one he threw 53 significant strikes against Zalgas Zumagulov 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 had never been finished and he put him out um I think Manel Kopp is turning a corner right here and add to that Suma Derji the biggest issue, and there aren't props for it yet but it's something I'm going to be on the lookout for Manel Kopp is a black belt in BJJ Suma Derji, all four of his losses have come by submission. We haven't seen Manel Cap really show off that grappling all that much, but maybe, just maybe, and I think he'll probably get a good price because he's not really known for it. Maybe he decides, you know, the easiest path to victory for me is to work on that ground game I've been working on, take this fight to the mat, and, and fish for a submission. If we get a crazy, like, 10-to-1 type of prop, I'll be having a little sprinkle on that. But Manel Cap for me, what about you? Is Cop a black belt? He got he got promoted because I, I know he was a brown he belt now, for yeah. sure. I, I, okay, yeah. So I saw our look, I ahead. saw our boy John Kelly saying that he was a black belt. Okay, okay. I'll, yeah, I'll take take him for his word for sure. Yeah, Cop definitely a brown belt. Recently got promoted to black belt, and then I am picking up what you were putting down. I was thinking the exact same thing. I was like, if this guy's smart and he just wants to fight a path of least resistance type fight, then the move would be to take Sumaderji down and submit him. Because not only does he have the BJJ black belt in his back pocket, but he's very physically strong in the clinch, and he is capable of getting those takedowns. He didn't need them against Zalga Zumagulov because he was just absolutely roasting the guy in the feet every step of the way for the entirety of the first round before knocking him out. Two knockdowns, 53 significant strikes landed in one single round. Walk in the park. You don't need no wrestling for that. The Audi Osborne fight, I mean, he dusts him out there with a flying knee, feeling comfortable enough. You don't need it there. You go back to that Pantoja fight in his debut. You're taking on a top five guy who went the distance with the current champion in a very competitive fight. This is this is tough work, man. And he goes out there at tail end of the first round, 
double underhooks, lifts him up, dumps him to the ground. Problem is, is that when you're on there with a guy like Pantoja, maybe you don't really want to spend that much time on the ground. But Tooth Nikolaou, you know, maybe you don't really want to go to the ground. And you're taking a guy like Sumaderji, that's absolutely it. Because Manel Cop's five foot five, like a 67 inch reach, 68 inch reach. So he's going to be giving up four inches of reach to Sumaderji and another like three inches in the height department. Sumaderji also a long, lanky, fights like a long, lanky anyway, southpaw striker. So that left hand is going to be coming right up the pipe. And Manel Cop, sometimes you see him early in fights, he has trouble finding his distance, trouble finding that range. Well, the best thing you could do is just take this guy down, throw him to the mat, and then have your way. I mean, outside of his four pro losses all being by submission, you saw the Lewis Smolka fight, which was his debut. Smolka was just two leagues above him once the fight hit the ground. And the kid is young and he is improving. But since then, he's fought, in, you know, for the most part, strikers outside of Malcolm Gordon, who he clipped early on and got him out of there. He's comfortable as a striker. That's where he's going to do his best work. If Manel Kopp wants to just strike with him the entire time, because of the the range, because of the output, it could be closer than it needs to be, although I still think Kopp outstrikes him. The, where he'll really shine is if he just goes out there, gets the takedowns, and looks to submit. Now, the other thing is that you've got somebody here in Sumaderji who's now officially left China, and he initially went to Team Alpha Male. He's left Team Alpha Male, and he's now at American Top Team, I believe. So he's still only 26. No doubt he's making improvements. But again, Kopp's only 28, you know, and he's full-time out of Las Vegas. So you got two good prospects here. Both guys are on their way up, but I think Kopp's just a little bit ahead in his uh, in his current skill set. And of course, show a little ring IQ here. Like, if, if unless cardio is an issue, if you can push the pace a little bit, I would say grind on this guy, grab a little bit, and find that submission. So I too don't know what the cop by submission prop is, but if it's juicy enough, I think it's worth a stab. It ain't. It isn't available yet. I don't believe. Let me just refresh. It wasn't literally an hour ago, but you know, you know how these things go. Always constantly in flux. Now there's only yeah uh, out on the market right now. There's only six props available in this fight, so it's not out there yet. But it could be a sneaky little play because I don't think I don't think the book the bookmaker is thinking like cop is like a submission threat. Yeah, well, it would just be one of those things where you don't see it very often, and he's not done it in the UFC, and he hasn't taken anybody down in his last three fights. He's an explosive knockout artist, right? Mm -hmm. Right? But it's like, yeah, but he has a coaching staff, and his coaching staff analyzes matchups, and his coaching staff would tell what's the point of getting a BJJ black belt if you didn't intend to grapple, if you didn't love to grapple, right? Who would stay committed to something for so that long and not want to use it at some point, right? course he's going to use it at some point got to be the right matchup this looks to be the right matchup yeah i mean it, it's got to be the right price though because you you run yeah. yourself into an issue all the time where you're just like if i was fighter a this is the path of least resistance and then it just doesn't happen just like you have to realize that doesn't always play out that way they don't necessarily see that they may see something that you don't see um in their in their process of of getting ready for a fight anyway we got uh, the last oh yeah yeah go ahead no no you go ahead well i was gonna say the last time we really liked a submission problem and it didn't actually come through was kevin holland over cowboy Oliveira by submission right because again he's a bjj black belt and he likes that standing guillotine choke so we got like a six to one seven to one price tag on it and it got steam big during fight week but that was the right price and then the fight plays out to be a striking battle. But again, it's a striking battle where Kevin Holland rocks Cowboy Oliveira in the second. Cowboy Oliveira falls down and curls up. You're either going to get a follow-up barrage, or you're going to get, I'll take this guy's back and I'll choke him out. Like, you can hurt the guy sometimes and then still switch off the striking to the submissions. Could be the case here, right? He could sting him with a big overhand right, drop him to the ground. You could hit him with that flying, you hit him with the ground. When the fight hits the ground and you put two hooks in, you got a black belt, man. Fish for the choke. If you get the right price, it's possible, but... Yeah, yeah, I would be looking in this particular matchup, I would be looking for nothing less than five to one, plus 500. In a fight which is probably one of the front runners for fight of the night, we got Charles Jourdain taking on Groovy Lando Venata, minus 130 for Charles Jourdain, plus 110. Lando Venata, who you got here, buddy? Yeah, you got to get underdogs in at some point, and I hate to do this because I've traditionally been a groovy Lando hater, but I think I'm going to go with Lando Venata. This one's going to be probably a striking battle. It's going to be close. It's going to be competitive. I completely get all that. There's something about Lando, though, dude. I used to think he was just a flash in the pan. Comes to the UFC, fights Tony Ferguson, drops Tony Ferguson twice. Oh, my God. Crazy first performance, but eventually loses. The spinning wheel kick over John McDessie, it was like that was one of the sweetest KOs to this day that you've ever seen. 
unreal. And then it's like they match him up soft and he wins, and they match him up mid level and he seems to lose. He, his head's never really been in the game. He's had some bad fights where he's taken some damage. Does fight good guys again, two fights against Bobby Green. But you can just see where like Bobby Green's going forward in his career and Lando's maybe just staying stagnant. That magic's not quite there. Wrestled a little bit collegiately, can strike, just unable to tie it all together. At this point, I'm very firm that I'm off Lando. He's not physical enough. He just doesn't have the desire. He fights a game plan where it's he's running away half the time, like the Yancey Medeiros fight. Does win that fight, but you know, he's not really engaging. He looks lost. Then at some point he leaves Jackson Wink for that Jackson Wink like Akama and he drops down to 145 pounds. So now he draws Mike Grundy, comes in as an underdog at, well, I guess he was a slight underdog, plus 105, similar to the spot he's in now against Jordan. He looked way better at 145 pounds. He was light on his feet. He was sticking. He was moving. His striking was straight, linear, punching up Grundy, beating him with a punch, which is a high insight victory because Grundy's coming off a bad loss. People are going to easily write it away. And also it's a split decision, despite the fact that 13 media members had it 30-27 Venata. I had it 30-27 Venata. 18 of 19 media members had it for Venata. One single guy had the fight for uh, the other way for uh, Mike Grundy. And so did one judge. So I don't know what they were looking at, but to me, Venata looked awesome. He stuffed the vast majorities of Grundy's takedowns. When he did get taken down, easily popped back up. Again, everything looked really on point for him. And the thing with Jordan is that his wrestling is there to be exploited. Mm -hmm. He's a little bit wild and reckless standing. Venata's not the easiest guy to hit because, again, look at the Yancey fight. He backpedals a lot. He utilizes every inch of the cage. And Jordan likes to come forward and try to kick. He just kicks, kicks, kicks. He tries to put that pressure on you. He tries to be aggressive. But against someone that's just going to matador, move side to side, and dart in with a straight shot and then jump out, that's going to give him problems. That's kind of what Lando does. He has been off a year since the Grundy fight, but Lando's still only 30 years old. Like, he's not shot. He's not shot porn. His reflexes are all intact. This move to 145 is long overdue. And I got a feeling that this guy's capable of putting together the right game plan. He can mix and take downs. He can just beat him to the punch. He can dance around. If it becomes a problem of output, he could probably still keep up with the output. Jordan looks like he's got killer output that just, oh my God, it's going to go on for days. It's going on for days. But he Andre Ewell, right? That's the one he's coming off. <clears throat> Looks awesome there. Andre Ewell's currently on a three fight win, uh, losing streak. He is two and four over his last six. The two wins, both split decisions. And like the Jonathan Martinez fight was a straight robbery. So Andre Ewell just hasn't looked good in a while. He's the kind of guy you could go out there and have a great performance against, right? Julian Arosa, where was his pace there? He lands 86 and he's completely gassed. You see Arosa taking over. Arosa scores the take down late. Arosa grabs a hold of the neck late. This is all stuff Lando's capable of doing. He can keep volume with you. He can keep you in line, but he can mix in the takedown and potentially fish for a submission as well. So I think the guy's ultra talented. I think he's his own worst enemy. I think he's kind of in his own head. Skills there. He's just never really been able to put it together. And maybe I'm just over looking into that one fight against Grundy at 145. But it looked like things were clicking together and finally going his way. So I, I think as an underdog, he could be there to expose Jordan a little bit, show him a couple things. And uh, I'm willing to take a shot on that underdog. Bro, on his tapology account, his photo, Groovy Lando's photo. Yeah. He's wearing a t-shirt that says wrestling <laughs> is life. Wrestling there, is there life. Take this fight to the mat. Like, I mean, Julian Rosa was able to take down Charles Jordan two times. He was able to find a darse choke in round three. Um, uh, the rest of Jordan's fights, he was, a, he was taken down five times by Andre Feely, four times by Des Greens. Like, the path is there. Um, I, I mean, everyone wants to see fireworks, spinning back kicks, high, high, uh, high volume striking from Charles Jordan. But the smartest path to victory here, I think, for Groovy Lando. Who wants to, you know, start his own win streak here, get himself in a better position moving forward um, for a renegotiation of contracts, yada, yada, yada. You know the drill. Um, I think is, is, is moving towards that wrestling. Maybe make it a little bit less of a fun fight. Oh, Pat! Oh, this is why we pay Pat the big bucks. The wrestling is life photo up there <laughs> on there i Looks mean this good. I, I i couldn't agree more i think lando's got more pass maybe he turns it into an absolute banger of a fight and we don't get to see it but i think that path could be exploited i think that path is ripe for the taking for lando venata i will be adding him to my card and uh seeing where the prop uh numbers go out there i'm seeing like 
anywhere from plus 850 out there right now to plus 1400. So it seems like a uh, a decent little sprinkle spot as well. It'd be it'd be live. And of course, Wikipedia has you backed up with Land of an All Star Wrestling at age 13. He later wrestled uh, NCAA D1 program University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, but dropped out after one semester. Right. So and and, and drops out after dropping out, moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. So. He wrestled one semester of D1 wrestling and then was like, I want to be a fighter. And abandoned wrestling to go, I've been wrestling his whole life. And wrestling since he's 13, attended a D1 program and has just been fighting since. You know, yeah, yeah. And he took down Mike Grundy, by the way, who was a bro- Commonwealth bronze medalist. So the, the path there. But like you said, we can see the path, right? But does the fighter necessarily agree with that? That remains to be seen. Or does he? Time. But I think we're or, on the same page here. Bro. Or does he go fight of the night bonus hunting? Which, I mean... <laughs> 50 G's is 50 G's. I think he needs two straight wins. Yeah, get your two straight wins first and then go bonus hunting. The NBA playoffs means next level basketball. Get in on the first round action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. This week, new customers can bet $5 on any team to win and get $150 in free bets instantly. You win no matter what. All DraftKings Sportsbook customers can also bet on NBA hoops with same game parlays. Combine multiple bets from the same game for a bigger payout. The more legs you add, the more money you can win. Plus, each day of the first round, get a risk-free bet up to $10 if your same game parlay doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code DOP. Bet $5 on any NBA team. To win their game during the first round of the playoffs and get $150 in free bets instantly. That's promo code DOP at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, we got uh, Mark andre Barrio taking on Jordan, the Beverly Hills Ninja. Right. Minus 190. For Barrio, plus 160 for right. I mean, this one's kind of silly because if this was before the Chidi and Jaquani fight for mm-hmm. for Mark andre Barrio, I'd be like, ah, you know, this guy's pretty cast iron, probably going to win. You know, he may have some dicey situations early on in the fight, but as long as he's able to survive that, you know, what uh, right will absolutely wilt. And, uh, and Mark andre Barrio will take over. But then you see Chidi and Jaquan, not exactly known as a potent finisher, absolutely lay him out super, super early in round one. You go back and you watch Wright versus like Bruno Silva. It's just like, man, like there were some real dicey situations for him there. I think this is one of those fights that's like, uh, if you're going to bet, if you're going to feel con- like... You- it's not a fight that you can be very, very confident about, but it. I feel like as the week goes on, I kind of go, MMA is a crazy bitch sometimes, and Jordan Wright is going to bring the heat early and often in this fight. If he doesn't finish him, he's probably going to get finished himself. Like it, there's, There is no ifs, ands, or buts about that. That's just the way the guy, the guy goes. Um, but I see like Wright by knockout, it's like plus 400 out there, right by knockout uh, in round one. That's it, what you want. Right, yeah. knockout round one. Uh, I only see a seven to one out there right now. It was 10 to one. People are jumping on that train because it's just like, uh, you know, know, right yeah. is plus 160, as we said. Well, like the majority of his winning condition is probably around one knockout. So the people who ch- hopped on that 10 to one, Good on you. I think even at seven to one, um, if you are if you're willing to play the gamble game, expect that you're probably going to lose a bet. I mean that that's that's where I think is the value here. I'm gonna pick Jordan Wright as well. I feel like Barrios' chin is questionable at this point. Do I love it? Absolutely not. But uh, I I really struggle to lay the wood on someone whose chin got compromised against not exactly a big time power puncher last time out going into this matchup where we know. Right is coming for your head early and often. So I'm going to actually pick right. What about you? I mean, I'm basically agreeing with all your same points for the most part. Like, I don't know that I am I got the cojones to outright pull the trigger on Jordan Wright, who I've just never been really big on. But, yeah, it all makes a whole lot of sense. Like, if you never saw Barrio get knocked out in his last fight against Chidi, it's a different conversation altogether because he never been knocked out in his career, not as a professional, not as an amateur. I think he has a combined 25 fights 
Never been knocked out. So never been knocked down. The guy's known for his durability. He takes a punch in the mouth quite well, and he storms forward, gets a hold of you, pushes you up against the cage, grinds on you. Ever since he's moved down to Sanford MMA, you're seeing him in better shape. Cardio's been better. There's a lot to like against Barrio, but 16 seconds. And the first punch that lands just drops his equilibrium completely, and then Chi just pounces on him, never lives, never gives him a chance to to get back into it, and that's the end of it. 16 seconds. First time you ever been knocked out. That's tough on its own. Now, Jordan Wright's initially booked against Roman Kopolov. Kopolov pulls out. Barrio takes the fight on short notice. Barrio asks them if they can move it up to a catchweight of 190 because he's taking it on short notice. And I think that's what this fight is, is a catchweight of 190. So none of that really screams like this guy. He's minus 190, isn't he? Like none of this screams, I got to have me some Marc-Andre Barrio. He's coming off his first career loss. It's 16 seconds, not career loss, first career knockout loss. It was in 16 seconds. He's taking this fight on short notice. He's up at a catchweight of 190, probably because he probably wasn't in the greatest of shapes. Uh, again, not a whole lot to like there. Jordan Wright, meanwhile, he just comes at you so damn fast that when you talk about punches chances and underdogs that could potentially win, and yeah, this guy's going to come at you. He's going to fight real hard for the first two, maybe three minutes. If he's going to win, it's going to be by knockout, as you mentioned, four to one, and it's likely going to be in the first round, which would be about a seven to one. So all of that definitely makes sense. I'll tell you what. I watched Bruno Silva versus Alex Pereira for 15 full minutes, and I seen this guy take clean shots from Alex Pereira, clean in the chin, Mm -hmm. and not really look that worse for wear. Jordan Wright pounced on him. He was hurt, Paul. Mm -hmm. He was hurt. This guy comes at you. He comes at you hard. And I think if he just goes at Barrio the way he's been going at people real hard for the first two or three minutes, the opportunity to clip him and pounce on something, it will be there. It will be there. If he doesn't get him out of there in the first two or three minutes, Barrio's grinding style up against the cage or just wearing on you, that's actually going to pay great dividends down the stretch. But it's a down the stretch type thing. So <sighs> I think I'm going to have Barrio. It'll be very low on the priority list. I think if I do switch, you're going to get tons more value out of right. But again, that would be like a PRP type pick. If you're looking for singular props, the knockout prop and the first round knockout prop for right all make sense. And I'm also going to have a little look see on the live market. Because I don't think this thing's getting out of the first round. But if it gets out of the first round, then I think Barrio's taking it. If Barrio takes a beating in the first round, but can survive that beating, you're going to get a decent price tag going into the second, and I would expect Wright to fall off. Like He really needs that that quick knockout. So probably an under one-and-a-half type fight, but if it starts to extend longer, that's when I think Barrio will will take over. Mm -hmm. Under one-and-a-half is plus 115. That's not a bad look either. Looks looks good to me, man. They're going to bang it out here. And you basically never like one and a half totals but jordan wright is that type of guy but he's beverly like hills ninja. the beverly hills ninja all right next up i mean you couldn't have two fights that were like more diametrically opposed you got the candy man making his return sergey kandoshko takes on dwight right uh dwight grant minus 120 for the candy man plus 100 for dwight grant i expect very very kind of low volume striking affair here um don't really have a strong lean on it don't love it's really really tough i don't know what to expect from kandoshko is only uh you know we haven't seen him since 2019 he's only 29 years old right now so you wonder you know he's been pulling out of fights obviously but you know it's hard to know where he's at in his game he's got to win over rasta Machman. Uh, lost against Habalov, but Habalov is is a solid, solid wrestler and is able to exploit that part of his game. Dwight Grand, obviously, the fight against Trinaldo. A lot of people thought that maybe he won there, but he throws like 30 significant strikes over the course of 15 minutes. It's like, it's really hard to win fights in in the UFC when your volume is just so incredibly low. Um, not a fight I feel all that great about. I think the best look between them is probably the over two and a half rounds, which is minus 170. I think that's a half decent parlay piece. Uh, I'll pick the Candyman just because I think I'm the only person who calls him that. I made up that nickname, uh, Sergey Kandoshko. But I don't, uh, this is a fight I'm more or less avoiding. What about you? 
Yeah, big time. The Candyman, uh, not your typical Russian, right? Because obviously you love your Russian grapplers. But yeah, this guy, he's one of your strikers from Moscow kind of mm -hmm. guys. He's not from the Caucasus. He's not going to go out there, take you down, grind you into a pulp, kill or be killed style mentality. He likes to do this little, you know, flashy bit of striking. He doesn't seem like the most physically strong guy going. And I remember I bet him I don't know, way heavier than I probably should have, I guess, against uh, Rostam Ackman in his UFC debut. Because, of course, Ackman the would human, never go on to win a fight in the UFC. <laughs> human blanket. The human, the was, human blanket, yeah. Well, I mean, this, he looks like he's wearing a wool sweater. The guy's got so much goddamn body hair. Now, now Candyman does beat him. But he does give up two takedowns. And it's not a pretty fight, man. No. Like, there's a lot to be desired here. He's not physically all that strong. He's striking, whereas that's obviously <laughs> where he's most comfortable. Again, he doesn't seem to have that big one-hitter quitter power at a higher level. He could beat these lower-level regional show guys back in, you know, in Russia. I suppose he, he can get some wins at that level. But the higher you go up, not going to go well for you. He squeaks out the win over Achman. Um, not a great performance. And then against or Rustam Habalov, completely neutralized. But that's the kind of thing that Habalov's able to do. And then three years on the sidelines, like. Has he made improvements? Has he been working on his grappling? Has he changed camps? Has he more, more than just changed camps, but really putting in time at any one place specifically instead of just, you know, dropping into an ATT for a few months and then leaving again? Like, I don't know that I could bank on anything that this guy's improved enough to, to, to go with him. Dwight Grant, meanwhile, if you were to bet him, what's likely going to happen is it's going to be a striking battle and it's going to be 15 minutes and it's going to be very boring and relatively competitive. And it'll be a split decision. And then no guarantees he's going to get it or not. But he's actually gone to split decision in four of his last six fights. Him and Zach Otto is a split. He loses. Him and Alan Joban's a split. He wins. I know. Dude's got to win over Alan Joban. Crazy, right? And then his last two fights, Devin Sekulich and Francisco Trinaldo. Again, both splits. Like his fights, because he has such low volume, the judges don't like it. It's a lot of inactivity. So even if he lands a couple decent punches every round, they're just not going to side with him. I would think Kandoshko's got enough volume that if he's pressing forward and he's trying to land on Dwight Grant, he can make something happen. But part of the reason that Dwight Grant's opponents don't put up big numbers against him is he's like a physically imposing enough dude, stands his grounds quite well, and moves a lot. So it's hard to rack up high numbers against him. He don't rack up high numbers against you. And then wrestling, grappling, like Dwight Grant's not much of a wrestler or a grappler, but he does get about one takedown per, per fight, you know, and... If he gets a takedown against Kandoshko, maybe that's enough to win him a round, but he needs two rounds. All I'm saying is this is going to be probably 15. I got to go in the distance. I got to be in relatively greasy and competitive, probably another split decision. <clears throat> but I think I would be more inclined to favor Dwight Grant, who, let's be honest, right? A fight with Francisco Trinaldo, a no easy task, and he's got a win, or he's got a win over Alan Joban and a loss to Daniel Rodriguez. And by the way, he had Daniel Rodriguez hurt. He has Daniel Rodriguez rock. Rodriguez rebounds in and, and knocks him out. So when you look at Joban, Daniel Rodriguez, and Francisco Trinaldo as opponents, very, very high level. When you look at what Sergey Kandoshko has been doing, nothing, nothing. He hasn't fought in three years. And when he was fighting three years ago, uh, there was a lot to be desired. So ever so slightly, I'll lean toward Dwight Grant, but <laughs> he burns me all the time. So like I, I know what I'm expecting. He's going to be very, very low on the list of uh, priorities. All right. Yeah, I mean, I forgot to, like, preface that, you know, the introduction of that fight by saying that these are, like, the bottom half of this card are, like, people I legitimately forgot were on the roster. Leads us right into Tyson Pedro. He I makes. He retired. I thought he retired. I never thought we'd ever see him again. He hasn't fought since December 1st of 2018 in the UFC, where he got finished in the third round against the corpse, what we probably thought was the corpse of Mauricio Shogun Hua back at that point. Straight arm lock before that. Uh, loss against Ovin St. Prue. I don't know what this guy's been up to. Literally have no idea what he's been up to. He had lost three of his last four fights. He's still young. He's 30 years old. He's 30 years old. And, I mean, this must be a hey, tie to Ivasa. We love you. You're our new fun, exciting heavyweight. Your buddy that, you know, is hanging around the gym seems like a nice guy. We're going to give him the Ike Villain away with treatment. It's hard to know what to expect from Tyson Pedro, but Ike Villanueva is 1 in 4 in the UFC. Surprised that he hasn't got cut at this point. His only win is over Vincius Moreira, who is one of the worst fighters in the UFC we've ever seen. 
Like, the one of the worst guys. Like, if he wasn't able to take you down and submit you, he literally had nothing. Uh, this is a setup fight for Tyson Pedro to get back on track. He's only 30 years old. Hopefully, he's been spending time in the gym. Minus 590, though. A lot of big questions. There's no way I can touch Ike because it's just I'll, I'll never bite. I'll never bet Ike Villanueva in the UFC. It's just never going to happen. I'll pick Tyson Pedro to win. Maybe we can find a, a prop to, like, juice this up, make this a little bit more interesting. Tyson Pedro should win this fight. I'm picking him to win this fight. But, yeah, min oh, nearly minus 600 on a guy you haven't seen who you thought retired and was never coming back. I have a lot of questions, naturally. So, Pedro obviously is the pick. I don't think I'm going to bet this one, though. What about you? Yeah, I can never really figure this one. Because, like, Tyson Pedro, again, when you look at... And a lot of his wins actually aged quite well. Like, Khalil Roundtree and Paul Craig, like, in hindsight. Damn, dude. Pretty nice, right? Here's the here's the strange part. Is that he looks like he's a grappler. And his wins over Khalil Roundtree by submission. Knocks out Paul Craig. Went over, he seems to be a submission guy. That's where he's spending most of his time. But the Latifi fight, he gives up the takedowns. He just gets neutralized easy. The Saperbeck Safarov fight, which is very low level, he gets taken down twice. He's able to snag up a Kimura, but doesn't look all that good. Obviously, St. Pru easily out grapples him. And Shogun took him down three times and beat him up. Like, is he a grappler? Because he doesn't look like he's having a whole lot of success grappling. And yet, that's the path of victory. Unlike a Tai Tuivasa, one of these tough Samoan guys that's going to come throwing leather at you. Tyson Pedro never really gone out there with the game plans of just strictly out striking guys. The benefit here against Ike Villanueva is that he can't grapple, right? He can't, he can't grapple. So I think if you were going to ease Pedro into the division, back in the division, that's what you would do. Again, like you said, he's only 30 years old. And uh, not only is clearly the UFC doing him a favor, imagine this, okay? So he loses to Shogun. And that's a big fight for the UFC to give you. Clearly, they got big plans for you if they're willing to give you a legend fight like shogun because what you could benefit from a victory would be huge he loses fair 15 months off you guys tapology open who do yeah. they try to ease him back in against paul they try to ease him back in against my god <laughs> vincius so, Moreira, the woke so they, the light so heavyweight woke <laughs> so they knew for sure like yeah we like this kid let's yeah. bring him back and just give him the layup let's give him the layup treatment let's give him the layup treatment and then he got hurt so now he's out again oh geez, now it's been a couple years i get it and they're like oh dude is vinicius still on the roster and they're like <laughs> no 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 he's not still on the roster and they're like oh well who's the next guy that took his spot and i was like ike ike took his spot it's like, Ike's still under contract? She Throw him in here. And that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. So, yeah, because he's been off a long time, and it's Ike likes to throw leather in the first two minutes, and they're big boys. And, like, yeah, I get it. I totally get it. But uh, I, the UFC knows what they're doing. They're easing him back in. Pedro should be able to just go out there, get his takedown, and then go to work with the rear naked choke, have the victory with the submission. Um, you've seen him get knocked out by Shogun, but it was a prolonged beating that got stopped in the third. Outside of that, he is one of these tough Samoan guys that's going to take a decent enough punch and roll with it. And Ike just doesn't have enough to fight strong for 15 full minutes. So they've got it set up for him to win. 590 is not exactly a, a big, pro a, like a likable price tag. I struggle to tell myself that I'm going to put him on the, my top ticket because if I was to go him and Jessica Andraj on the top ticket, I'm still not getting my, my plus money. And there is some invert in danger, but you will yeah. not see him any lower than the second ticket. You know, like he is going to be one of our favorite guys this week in all likelihood. It's obviously a little bit too early in the week for props, but like the only one I see out there for Pedro by submission is plus 125. It's just like, yeah, they know the ratings on the wall. You know, yeah, Pedro's not I'm much of a striker, but like at plus 125, it's like uh, those, those types of props don't get me all that excited. I realize that's probably the most you know, the highest likelihood of results, but you know, I mean, at what plus 125 it's, it's earmarked as being, I don't have it right in front. I can't think of it right off the top of my head, but like, yeah, 47% likelihood or something like that. 45 ish percent likelihood. It sounds about right to be perfectly honest. I'd be interested in seeing the inside the distance, obviously, because if you're offering you plus one twenty five on the submission, and he's more of a submission <laughs> Pedro guy, inside going to give you Pedro inside the like, distance is like plus or minus two fifty. They aren't. They're that, not giving way you better than five nine. They're not right? giving you anything fun to play on this one. They know Ike sucks. They know why Ike is here. It's just Ken Pedro off of three years over three years off 
show up and uh, and and do the damn job. If he can't, I mean, show him the door. Like this, I'll talk, I'll you got the Ike here. treatment after getting the Vincius yeah, Marrera yeah. treatment. They're giving you all of the treatments. You better show up and get the job done. Ike has 13 pro losses, 12 of which were inside the distance. Here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Seven by knockout, five by submission. So you're going to finish him. How you're going to finish him? Maybe that's the question mark, right? Like There's you could submit and you could knock him out, but I think we're all agree. But if I got a 590 and I can reduce it to a 250, like honestly, I'm saving yeah 340 points. Like that's that's quite quite nice, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's yeah. Pedro inside the distance is uh, probably a lock, um, <laughs> unless. Well, I no, mean, you no, you just saying that right then, <laughs> done. Well, this I'm is not, the kind of crap we I'm see not, all the time. It should be a lock. And these idiots lie on top of each other because one guy's been off for four years and one guy is fighting to survive. I don't know. I don't know. Shit happens. It does. Shit always happens in MMA. All right. We got a, a, a Aori Kilang taking on Cameron Ells. Minus 225 Aori Kilang. Plus 185 Ells. What's your take here, buddy? Yeah, and in today's version of guys you didn't know are still on the roster, Elsa. Cameron Else is back, 34 yeah. years old, rocking out. You didn't think he'd make it to the UFC in the first place, but he did. And then gets, you know, I think it was a 10 8 first round against Kyler Phillips, and then he gets completely smoked out of there in the second round. Uh, ground game looked like it needed a lot of work. Uh, just everything needed a lot of work. He had spent a little time with Donald Cerrone at the BMF Ranch. But again, even his wins on the regional scene is win prior to the UFC, a 3 and 14 opponent. Prior to that, 0 and 1. 0 and 0, 1 and 1. He does show a win over Patty Pimblett, like 2013. It was a 35 second Anaconda choke. But then again, since then, the notable names that I noticed is Spencer Hewitt, who's got two losses to it. Ed Arthur, I'm actually fond of. And that's it. Like he he generally loses when he has that bit of a step up, and then he comes to the UFC. He's short notice. He did not give a very good of account of himself in the slightest bit, and then. Uh, they rebooked him one year later. He pulled out, and now they're rebooking him effectively almost, I guess it's about a year and a half. So I just, I'm not really seeing much out of him. Orichi Lang, meanwhile, he's been coming up on the short end of uh, decisions, but geez, there's actually a decent amount to like about him. He's very physically strong. He's a go getter. His fight with Jeff Molina, uh, a treat to watch live, a treat to rewatch on the tape study. Like these guys go toe to toe. Jeff Molina, one of the finer prospects within the division. And again, Richie Lang keeps pace with him. So he does a really good job in that fight. I did think he lost, but something you can build off of. I did bet him against Cody Durden. I think he was a slight plus 140 underdog. I thought it was good dog money in that spot. And honestly, I thought he fought an excellent fight. Cody Durden did enough to edge him out, largely because of the wrestling. Be able to win spots of the round necessarily. Not necessarily I'm not going to have fight. to worry about the wrestling here. Yeah, exactly. It seemed to me like if you can mix up some good st sturdy wrestling, you can stifle him a little bit. But if you're going to stand there and you're going to have a fight, it's going to be a problem. Now, Cameron Ellis doesn't have the wrestling to take him down. He doesn't have the grappling to quickly submit him if he did take him down. And as far as the striking goes, I, I just think at some point Richie Lang's going to move through the pocket, clip this guy. We actually saw last week with uh, Haile Alatang versus Kevin Kroom where we wanted Haile Alatang to wrestle. The path to victory was to go out there and wrestle. He's but like dead. you said earlier in the show, these guys, sometimes they just know something you don't. And he knew, <laughs> I'm going to step in and I'm going to club this guy lopsided the head. He knew I'm going to hit Kevin Kroon with that right hand. He just had to find the timing on it. 47 seconds and he finally finds it and he clunks him. You mm -hmm. can see this one going the same way. I would expect Richie Lang to be the bigger, stronger, more physical guy, press forward, have some success. And I also get the feeling at some point, if it becomes a striking battle, Cameron else might be moving on the outside, but at some point he's going to get clipped with something and fold to the floor. So I would go with Richie Lang again, 0-2 in the UFC, but I think the results uh, are a little bit misleading. And Cameron else just really not enough for me to go off of from him. So uh, Richie Lang minus 225. This is a guy that's 0-2 in the division. Get it? But do agree, and I do think that he'll get the victory. Orichi Lang never been knocked out, even He's like tough. in all of his all of his you know Chinese regional scene fights, never been knocked out. Has been submitted twice. It seems like the knockout is the only concern here. It's like, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think Orichi Lang should roll here a hundred percent if he can mix in the wrestling a little bit. Probably makes the path easier, but who knows? It could just be fireworks, as you were kind of alluding to right off the top that uh you know 
uh, that Else and him kind of exchange. One guy's chin holds up, the other's doesn't. And that's all she wrote. I mean... The, Mo- the Mongolian murderer, Paul. You really want to go against this guy? No, I wouldn't bet against somebody <laughs> with that nickname, 100%. All right, we got uh, Marcin Pracnio taking on Felipe Linz. Minus 125 Pracnio, plus 105 Linz. Linz coming back down from, uh, from heavyweight for this fight. I believe he weighed in at like 240. Last time he was around. Pracnio is one of those guys that we like to usually pick on um, for uh, an absolutely abysmal chin. This guy could not take damage whatsoever. But the thing is, those last two fights against Khalil Roundtree, and obviously he got the Ike treatment. Yeah, we expect him to win against Ike Villanueva. Don't get me wrong. But against Khalil Roundtree particularly, it's like, he knows his issue now. It's like, I can't just stand in the pocket and throw bows. I can't just... He fights a very, very smart game plan um, and, and, and keeps himself out of trouble a lot more um, than he used to before. I'm sure there was probably tons of people who lost a lot of money on Khalil Roundry by knockout props. I bet you that was, you know, the bookie sent their kids to Disneyland from... Khalil Roundtree by knockout props. Um, I don't know what to make of this one. Obviously, Lynn's coming back to 205. Prackney is a guy I used to like to pick on, but I think he's turning a corner, figuring out who he is as a fighter. I think Prackney can win this fight at range, stay out of trouble, don't get clipped. Linz isn't exactly some murderous power puncher. He has knocked out some a little bit lower level of competition. Uh, talk this talk this one through with me because uh, uh, I don't know if I can get to Prakneo minus one twenty five, but that's where I'm leaning right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems like the reasonable thing. Here's how we'll talk you back into it, okay? So Felipe Lin's finally going back to two hundred five, which is reasonable because he's not really that big of a heavyweight, right? Me and my boy Paul Shaughnessy one time we we're hanging out it was back in the day, we we're drinking some beers. This is before Paul was. Uh, had a, a very critical disease, celiac, where it just completely racked him. Racked him. He's a different man now. Back in them days, we used to have a couple cold pints. We're watching Bellator, and Kelly Anunson comes out to fight one Felipe Linz. He's a sizable underdog. And as Paul says, yeah, Kelly Anunson, he's going to get killed. We all agree. Kelly Anunson's going to get killed. And he won. <laughs> Felipe Linz blows his knee out. And then Paul had this little running joke where it's like, you don't let friends bet on guys. The loss to Kelly Anunson. No. And he would do this. So he lost to Kleber Silva two fights later. He's a minus 400 favorite. He gets knocked out in the second. He lost to Nemkov. This is 205. Then he moves up to heavyweight. What's interesting here is that he sized to PFL as a heavyweight. Never fought a heavyweight before. Now he's a heavyweight. Beats Alex Nicholson at 231. Next fight, Kyle Allencar, 229. Next fight, Jared Rochal, 265. So he puts on a full 35 pounds for that fight, wins it. Beats Josh Copeland in this tournament final at 234, and he got paid $900,000 for that fight because it's the heavyweight final for PFL. Wins the tournament, won almost a million dollars, fought four guys that couldn't cut it in the UFC. Kyle Allen Carner fought in the UFC, but Nicholson, Rochal, and Copeland obviously all had. Eh, they were like bottom feeders, and he fluctuates between 230 and 260. It's strange. So when he signed to the UFC, the hype was still there. And then Paul says to me, well, you don't let friends bet on guys that lost to Kelly and Nunsen. And he's right. He lost to Orlovsky and Tanner Bozer both times as the favorite and look like shit. And now he's going back to 205? Really? Because what's interesting is since since he lost back to Tanner Bozer, okay, he pulls out of the Dante Mays fight. Pull him, yeah. hurt. Then he pulls out of the Ben Rothwell fight the first time, undisclosed injury. Okay. Second time, Lynn's not medically cleared to compete. Third time, Lynn's withdraws undisclosed injury. St. Prue was the one that bailed out of that matchup, but him versus Azamat Mirzakhanov, he pulls out again. He's pulled out of like four or five fights, all He's due to pull, injury. Yeah, pull out he hasn't fought in two years. He looked like crap the last time you saw him. He looked like crap even prior to that. He looked like crap the last time he fought at 205. And he's taking on a guy that's got like a shitty reputation, but isn't actually half bad. You nailed all that yourself. You know what I mean? You figured it all out yourself. Pracnio had a bad uh, reputation because he was just reckless. And Sam Alvey punched him out and it was real mm-hmm. embarrassing. And, and and then the Ankaleo fight, in hindsight, hey, buddy, no shame there. The Mike Rodriguez fight, you know, it's, it's embarrassing. But 
His chin's holding up a little bit better now. He's willing to fight hard for 15 minutes. His striking is uh, opportunistic, to say the least. And, like, he'll pounce on you with some decent strike. Linz allows the moments to evade him. Same thing with the Arlovsky fight. Like, he's just staring at him the whole time. And at 205, he doesn't wear a punch all that good. He's going to have to cut somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 pounds just to make light heavyweight. So keep your eye on the scales. Is he going to pull a thick willy here or what? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but how did that work out for Thick Willie? Not particularly good, right? Oh, so sometimes yeah, yeah, no, it didn't, no. I think he's looking for something. He's lost. And he made so much money in the PFL that it's like that's the money he's living off of now, but he hasn't scored a win since then. He's not looked good against two opponents in the UFC. And I, I get he's dropping down to 205, so the automatic assumption is like, oh, dude, he's coming down from heavyweight. Oh, he's now more power. This is the proper weight class for him. It's like we've seen him at this weight class before one like he was all that good truth be told so yeah yeah i, I would I, I like i like pracnia i like pracnia and i'm thinking that pracnia might be able to get him outside uh, inside the distance but i don't know if it'll be the under one and a half because it might be like you need to extend this guy to the second yeah. or the third and then of course you said it you nailed Prakhnia all the has been fighting a lot smarter like he just he's yeah. avoiding he's not getting in the pocket and crashing and banging like he used to he's learned that like i can't take a punch you know that maybe on maybe on his rise up through the ranks when he's taking like lower level competition he was able to take those shots but he knows at this level he's not able to take those shots so he's been fighting very very smart using his longer frame um yeah i don't know if i would get what what is pracnio by knockout i'm gonna look that up for us on the fly here pracnio but it better it better be a a much bigger well i guess they don't have it they have I see uh, Prack now inside the distance, anywhere from plus, yeah, well, plus 150 to plus 165 out there right now. Yeah, I remember when Pr- Prack now used to fight for it one doesn't fighting get me excited. championship. And I think I would build... just play the money line. Sorry, I keep cutting uh, you off. Yeah, right? no, 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 it's all good. I would probably just play the money line too. I think he's live for the knockout. But again, him versus Khalil Roundtree was a fight that very should have been an inside the distance fight on either side. And didn't play it that way. Again, a win over Roundtree looks pretty good in hindsight. But, yeah, the one thing I never got about him is, again, uh, Pracnio, he starts training karate at age 12. He is a multiple-time Polish champion in Kyukushin Karate and plays second at the European Championships. But but he doesn't really fight. Like, isn't karate supposed to be defensive? Like, aren't you supposed to, like, intercept your opponent? Like, he just goes straight at them like a wild man. That he's kind of getting away from. And, by the way, Kyukushin Karate is a lot. Kyukushin, sorry. Kyukushin karate is a lot more aggressive. Like, it's a lot more offense uh, than, like, a Machida karate, for example. But, uh, yeah, at the same time, like, I think he's doing a better job of now trying to intercept his opponent and fight them properly. And Could be enough to squeak one out over Felipe Linz, who's just, you can't let friends bet on guys that lost to Kelly and Nunson. I think the advice has actually stood true for, like, 10 years now. So it's good as far as I'm concerned. All right. And, I mean, this is, like, the I forgot they were on the roster entirely fight of the night. We've got Conor McGregor's buddy taking on journalist. Uh, Conor McGregor's buddy is a minus 1125 favorite. Journalist can be had for plus 700. Like, what? what is the Mike Jackson experiment? Why are we doing this again? I mean, he won a close, relatively close. I mean, anybody who goes to the decision with CM Punk... Like that's that's that shows that you had no business being in there whatsoever. Did he win the fight? Did he win it very clearly? Yes. Did CM Punk have any business fighting in the UFC? Absolutely not. Nobody thought that he. I, I don't understand how. I mean, they've tried to run this back twice. You know, he was supposed to January of 2021. They were supposed to run this run this through. And then they tried to run it again in May of uh, 2021 so it's like and now they're running at this time dean barry uh, conor mcgregor's buddy he's coming off of a win on the irish regional scene against someone who is six and 30 um i i know he's got like some decent decent striking a good karate background he should win this fight don't get me wrong and i i mean they gave him the perfect opponent that literally i just, just doesn't make a lick of sense whatsoever um if if dean barry belongs at this level any sh- and any in any way shape or form it shouldn't be against mike jackson who is straight up a, just a, a journalist a journalist that they found after they tried to run 
Mickey Gall, who they had found to take on CM Punk, and like, whoa, 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 that was a bad idea. Then they tried to run, um, you know, Mike Jackson, because they're like, okay, this is the worst guy on the roster. And he got the win against CM Punk. But, like, this is silly. This is really silly. Dean Barry, of course, wins against against journalists. It's it's really dumb though. The question becomes: When does he finish him? Does he finish him in round one? Because nobody's maybe he ends up at the top of your PRP. But uh, yeah, the over under is basically set close to a pick 'em right now. So that's really: Is there any value there? I see a lot of people saying that the over should be the play because Barry's more of like a uh, a technical kickboxer, a little bit more of a point kickboxer, but he's taking on a journalist. Like, imagine if they sent me. I know Mike Jackson is Mike Jackson would kick would kick my ass. I've never I've never fought unless me. Uh, who knows? Who knows? You saw me wrestle a little Mike bit Jackson. before. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. I have. I, I saw Pat. I, 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 I gouge you just to get out of a guillotine. It's true. Uh, I uh, back in my my younger days, I can uh, I played football. One punch so ball. It's like, well, I played football, so like I can wrestle. I can I can take you down. I can take you down and hopefully hold you there. That may be enough against Mike Jackson. So uh, I wouldn't call myself a journalist, but uh, yeah, I mean, if Mike Jackson loses this fight, maybe we maybe maybe we run uh, Shag versus Jackson post celiac Shag. Uh, <laughs> maybe I may have a uh, a takedown uh, path to victory here. That's true, but back, at least back in the day, if you would have gotten to complete that takedown on him, you just had all that gluten in you, right? So you're on top of him and just so much gluten running wild. True. Might have been difficult for him to scramble and get back up. Celiac Paul, I don't know, man. I don't know. I got a feeling you're probably in decent shape. You're probably feeling okay, but uh, might not be as easy to hold him down. Truth be told, this is like a freak show fight for the UFC standards. I don't really know what the angle is here. With Dean Barry, like, yeah, I get it's Connor's buddy. It looks like he's got some decent enough striking. He's attempted to get some, well, he has some fought some professional kickboxing as well. And in MMA, it seems like he's lacking of a ground game because he's a kickboxer. His one loss is by rear naked choke, is up the back, gets caught. If you stay standing in front of him, he's going to put you away. But I'll give him credit. He's trying to fight a decent level. Like, he tried to fight Michelle Quinones as a professional kickboxing match. Quinones, UFC veteran, uh, Bruce Lunch Medial, bare knuckle boxer, MMA, you know, regional show veteran kind of guy. These are, would have been decent wins. Even his last fight against Drew Lipton, it's only because his Hugo Preda guy pulls out. Like, I think he's attempting to up his level. He just almost never fights. When he does, it's against guys that don't show a ton. Maybe it's hard to, to gauge him. But the UFC signed him to fight Mike Jackson like two years ago. What I don't understand is he signed to fight Mike Jackson, Jackson pulls out. So they rebook him to fight Jackson. Barry pulls out. And then they must cut him because that's when he goes back to Titan FC where he pulls out of a fight and then ends up fighting this Drew Lipton for Titan FC and then resigns to the UFC. Like, I don't know. They had him pen to paper to fight Jackson. That fight doesn't happen. They more or less were like, there's not one single guy on the roster other than him that we think you could beat. So you let him go. And he, be he beats a guy at 6 and 30. And then you sign him to come back so you can put a Mike Jackson fight together for the third time like how does that make any sense and for mike jackson like i never understood this part he he loses to mickey golf fair they release him okay they sign him back for the cm punk fight in which they thought he would lose came in as a two-to-one favorite but if there was a guy that cm punk could potentially win it was going to be this guy mm -hmm. and he, he painted cm punk up dude he landed like 61 significant strikes he just stayed to the outside and jabbed his face off the whole time didn't have any power you know he's not clearly not very good he was way better than CM Punk. And then he kind of asked for a fight, and they never gave him one. He said, release me and let me go to Bellator. They never did. They've just quietly kept him on the roster for four years. He actually even was like, well, can I at least be the official photographer at the events? And they said no. <laughs> They've done this guy no favors. Zero favors have been done for Mike Jackson. So I, I really can don't understand why I feel like four we years later the, they've rehashed this. I feel like we should I, – I see people saying the over is the value play here, but it's like – I think Barry I almost, can crush him. I almost feel like we should just bet the under. I think that uh, – when we saw Mike Jackson fight – I mean, we have only seen him really fight twice, but when he took on Mickey Gall, and obviously it was a submission, but he's done in 45 seconds, like – there's a reason why there's pro fighters. There's a reason why there's journalists. Any journalist doesn't survive for more than seven and a half minutes against anybody who is an accredited pro fighter. 
We should just be banging the under. Yeah, Blindly. the line still seems off. All that in mind, doesn't it still feel like it's off? Oh, and by the way, happy 420 to everybody because Mike Jackson actually never beat CM Punk. It's a no contest because he <laughs> had the reefer. <laughs> Imagine the biggest moment of your entire career, if not life. I don't know if he's got kids. I don't know what else he's done that was cool. But uh, the biggest moment of your professional career, certainly, and it's taken away from you. Uh, well, at least the people know what happened that night. The people, the people don't forget what happened that night. Mm. Yeah. All right. And then uh, right before when we were making the graphics, I realized that Preston Parsons versus Evan Elder has been booked for this card. I've done no research on Preston Parsons or Evan Elder because Preston Parsons was supposed to be on this card. He was supposed to be taking on... Louis Koski. Louis Koski. And I didn't get to looking at tape at that because I like it would already Koski had already ta- uh, tested positive for COVID. And I was just like, well, that saves me some tape time. So I haven't looked at... Do you have anything to say about... Par- I didn't even make a graphic for it to show you how little I know of it. I, I, it wasn't even graphic worthy. We slapped this on at the end. Preston Parsons, Evan Elder, do you have any takes? If if the answer is no, that's completely fine too, because I don't. Yeah, well, I mean, it was added late, so obviously I got to look at it, but it just appears to be a classic striker versus grappler matchup. Evan Elder, it was 6-1 uh, as an amateur. His only loss as an amateur was to Luis Pena, and Elder was 19 years old at the time, so he was actually a pretty good amateur. Turns pro, he's full-time out of Sanford MMA now, and it looks like he's a decent prospect, but you'll see his last number of wins. He fight, tends to fight lower-level guys. He's got good striking, he's dynamic enough, he's got good finishing ability. He tends to search for the knockout. He had a fight with Cody Fister booked. Looks like it's one week later, two weeks later, sorry. Two weeks later, so I wouldn't say he's necessarily short notice. It seems like he's been training for something else, and with Cody Fister obviously coming from a wrestling background, the striker was going to be tested against a grappler in that spot. Seems like something he's probably ready for. Again, Sanford MMA, they're going to have him well-equipped, ready to go. Preston Parsons, meanwhile, is quite the opposite. He's a fairly one-dimensional with his grappling approach. He wants to get you to the ground. He wants to submit you. Almost all of his wins are submission, largely by rear naked choke. And again, his losses are all inside the distance as well, two of them by being by knockout. The pass I'll give him is that Daniel Rodriguez, his three losses, Daniel Rodriguez, no shame there, but he did get knocked down the first. Mike Perry, really no shame there, but he did get knocked down the first. And then Valdir Arroyo, known as the BB Monster, longtime ATT fighter, longtime Black Zillion fighter, longtime Florida uh, regional scene guy. Tough, you know, he caught him in a guillotine choke. So his losses are to three accredited guys. His wins are over fairly lower level guys for the most part. He does show a win over um, Ignacio Bahamondes with a first round armbar. He does have that grappling in his back pocket. But I think if it ends up staying standing, he's probably going to get clipped at some point. And that's kind of how I see this one going with Evan Elder. Evan Elder should be prepared, trade for Cody Fister, probably spending a lot of time on his wrestling, stuff the takedown, keep his fight standing, put the pressure on him, probably going to find the punch at some point and knock him out. So the pick would be Evan Elder. I don't know the line. I don't know the props. I don't know any of that. And, of course, I'd like to look at it a lot more. <clears throat> but if they give you a good-looking line to as an as a opener and it's not soft opener on your book, whatever the case is, uh, that would be my pick, yeah. And producer Pat Mayo. What would you set it at? You know, I had trouble this last time because I thought Lusa might be a slight favorite over Muniz. Muniz ends up being a 2-1 to one favorite and then looks like a 10-1 to one favorite. So it was way off last time. But I would say that Evan Elder would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of... I'd, I haven't looked in enough tape, but I would I would put him in the neighborhood of a minus 185, minus 200 favorite. Um, if you can get something lower, like if it opens up at minus 165, I'd say hit it. Minus 175, hit it. Minus 185, likely hit it. But you... Yeah, yeah, I just Preston, but like Paul said, right? Preston Parsons had the one fight in the UFC against Daniel Rodriguez, knocked down the. Well, I mean, you just said <laughs> you haven't seen enough of the guy. These are more guys you can't remember them being on the roster because they haven't had much success. That's his problem. His wins on the regional, right? You can see Socrates Pierre, Wesley Golden, uh, David Mundell, Ignacio Bahaman is obviously. There's some names there. Wesley Golden obviously have a bad record, but a long season guy. There's some names there. He's fought some decent guys. He's submitted some decent guys. He could go out there and get the submission. I tend to prefer grapplers that win a grappler versus uh, striker type matchup. But in this case, I think Evan Elder is going to be good enough to stuff those takedowns. Training with a better camp, going to be more prepared, has a better striking, should clip him and knock him out. So I think if I had to set the line, I'd set it at minus 185 for uh, Evan Elder. Hopefully it settles somewhere around there. And yeah, I'd be interested in playing him for the time being, but... 
still gonna watch way and still gonna fully tape that fight paul messaged it to me like 20 minutes before we came on the I didn't, show so there wasn't much to be done i didn't know it was even on the card until 20 minutes before the show and as I, yeah. as as we said there literally aren't any odds nobody's no but no sports book has posted anything on this so who knows if it even happens? Uh, I'll quickly. I have Manel Cop. I caught it a little bit earlier in the week. Minus 145. I think he's definitely decent still at the current, like, minus 190 that's available out there. The other people who are making my list, uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to concoct the entire card this week, but Aori e- Kilang, I think he's a decent, uh, a decent parlay piece. I'm going to figure out a way to add him. I just think the chin holds up. Not much of a grappling threat in else. As long as we don't get knocked out early, should absolutely roll. Else is kind of knockout or bust. Uh, Prakniel, scary guy I used to target, but um, I feel like he's he's the play for me. I'm going to end up with some money on Marcin Prakniel. God, God, God help me. Um, Lando Venata plus 110 definitely have interest in that gonna see what happens when the sub prop comes out for uh, for groovy Lando as well because wrestling is life Cody um, Barry and Jackson under one and a half rounds I think that's I, I think that's how I'm gonna go about this anytime you put a journalist in there against a professional fighter I'm just gonna bet the under one and a half because minus 1125 is unbettable. So uh, under, I'm gonna I'm gonna end up with some money on that. I think a, par, a decent parlay piece is Grant versus the Candyman over two and a half rounds. It's minus one seventy. I think that's a good spot. Uh, Andrade money line. I kind of want to see her at the weigh-ins. I don't want to run into a situation where she looks awful on the scales, and then already be pot committed at that point. But I think she's a decent parlay piece as well. And then Guida. We like Guida. But the line seems to be working against us right now. Maybe better to just let wait. Maybe better to wait till live. But that's where I'm at right now. As always, at Paul Shag on Twitter, I will post my my plays on Saturday at some point. We lost Cody. He's gone. What oh. happened? I'll hit you with the PRP. Yeah. Yeah. Hit you with the PRP oh, right he's here, back. Paul. He's back. Yeah. Back to hit you with the PRP. Nice. Um, and uh, we're, a little, we're a little light on underdogs this week. But uh, we're going to go Jessica Andrade, Clay Guida, Even Money, Alexander Romanov, Macy Barber, Manel Kopp, Lando Venata, dog number one. I guess I got Barrio for the time being. We're going to go with Dwight Grant, technically dog number two, Tyson Pedro, uh, Richie Lang, uh, Marcin Prakniao, Dean Barry and evan elder uh the two perhaps best well I'm, i can't give you pfl picks because it's wednesday so like what good would that do you but enrique borzola is only a minus 155 against nikita mikhailov over on bellator for friday mikhailov's taking the foot of short nose for josh hill barzola is just like a fantastic grinder you saw how good he looked last time out cardio for days and he had a lot of ring rust to shake off in that fight so that's excellent price tag but danny sabatello at minus 310 might be the pick of the whole weekend. Dude does Ooh. not stop. He just clings on to you and grinds and grinds and grinds and grinds and grinds. It's not the most entertaining style, but it is a very effective style. He's basically Italian Colby Covington, and he's got just a very admirable grind. So yeah. at minus 310, he's likely going to be a piece for me as well. And I think between PFL, which I'll hopefully tweet some stuff out. Uh, but anyways, yeah, that aside, Bellator, UFC, there's a KSW, there's an LFA, I think you could, this is not the greatest looking UFC card, but you could definitely pick and choose what you like the most and put them all together. So hopefully we can hit at least three, four lines worth of tickets, set up that hedge head opportunity on Andrage. And if not all that stuff, maybe even hit that PRP. Big UFC one is what I'd like. We've got one Bellator PRP so far this year, but of course, no year's complete without the UFC one. So hopefully we'll knock that off one sooner rather than later. What happened to you? Where'd you go? How'd we lose you? I have so many questions. Well, you were talking, and then I could see it jittering on my end, so I start clicking with the internet thing, and then for whatever reason, it just dropped me out. So then it said it was loading, but I was like, you know, instead of waiting for this thing to load, I'm just going to exit myself out, come back in, thinking the magic of TV land and the magic of editing, you could just do a shot of you, throw up a board, nah, who cares? Fu- no one's going to notice. No one's going no to notice. It's I wasn't funnier there. this way. I come in to hit you with the PRP. It would have been an easy snip, snip, cut, cut. But of course, we're not looking to lie to the audience, so... 
yeah, I think my internet might have dropped. I don't know what the hell dropped out, it, but it did drop out. Yeah. yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it adds it adds to the fun of all of it. I mean, there <laughs> there's probably a moment where people are watching this show. You're about to hit him with the PRP. You're gone. Pat says he'll step in and give the PRP. And there's probably a few people watching who are an ab- who were in absolute shambles for about a 10 second little moment there where Cody doesn't have the PRP. Oh my God, is Cody going to come back? And he did come back. Thanks as always, Cody Saptic, breaking down the fights with me. Thanks for producer Pat Mayo for doing all the sweet cuts behind the scenes here. For Cody and Pat, I'm Paul saying goodbye and good luck. Oh, oh, oh.